In case anyone asks, this is the new slide template I was given. <laughs> My name is Mark Suter. I work for Unisys Australia. We have a number of large government clients, and this is hopefully something not too descriptive about how we manage to not get sued. So that's hopefully what you saw in the schedule that got you here, if it wasn't just simply a matter of standing still after Tridge. Anyway, laziness. Laziness is something we value greatly, even if we don't call it laziness. This is straight out of the Pearl book. It is something that is very easy to go wrong on. The easiest way is to do the traditional laziness and do nothing on the idea that the bad thing will never happen. That does work um, for a short time or if you're very lucky. Uh, we are neither lucky nor able to take advantage of bad things not happening because in our environment with security as the topic, pretty much our environment is defined as people trying to make bad things happen. So it doesn't give us much latitude for laziness of the bad kind. So security is, as I say there, a grab bag. One of the things that's very easy to recognize about security, I had a conversation a little while ago about what actually is a sysadmin. In many ways, you can tell the bad ones, but it's very difficult to define what exactly is a good one. So for security, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, that's a fairly common definition. Another common definition is the asset threat separation. That there includes you know, your risk management and your threat risk assessments and how you decide to mitigate the various risks you have, how much risk you're willing to accept. And there's a whole grab bag of various standards. Does anyone actually know all of them? Does anyone actually know all of them? I'll give you bonus points if you can get 53 there, Axie 53. Does anyone know what that one is? It's not a misprint If anyone down the back. Yes, Russell? James. Oh, James. I've got lights straight in my eyes. Sorry. James. It's a PSD standard on information security. If correct. You're thinking of ASCII, ASCII 33? Oh, you <laughs> 53 is not a typo. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the fifth, that one you're thinking of is actually now called the ISM. The DSD loves renaming things. Acronyms are half their fun. But most of those are very weighty documents. They're very good for killing trees. Your photocopier manufacturers love you printing those out. Most of them are actually now available for free. There was a time, even 10 years ago, where you had to pay a fortune to get the physical document or a PDF, or they were classified and you couldn't get them. So that IS, the one there in bold on the second line, ISM, is the Information Security Manual. It's available from www.dsd.gov.au. It's a very prescriptive document. It says, if you do this, you must do this. If you do this, you must do this. If you have this, this must be turned on, this must be turned off. It even goes down to the point of saying, these are the SSHD options you must have on and off. Like, it's very, very detailed. You don't have to follow it. I mean, where I am, we have to follow it. But the same with PCI DSS, Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. They are huge checklists. They are, in some cases, completely useless. Uh, one of the things that's in the first one there is you should have a security policy. I kid you not, there's about 10 pages on why you should have a security policy. Often, security comes down to that last thing, how to make people doing stupid things. One of the classic stupid things people do is they don't do it. We should have backups. Great. Who's doing them? Have they been tested? That comes down to security. Like security, if you define it as availability, is just as important to have your good guys, whomever they may be for you, having access to the data. That's just as important as not having the bad guys, whoever they may be for you. Security theatre, I mention it because it's always a lot of fun. Where I am, there is a lot of stuff that you could easily call security theatre. So the fact that we have all those stupid checklists PCI DSS is a classic one because it applies more widely than ISM. That's the standard that Visa, MasterCard, Amex and so forth have. They use it to beat people over the head. So a merchant has a problem. 
and someone steals credit card details. It turns out not to be the merchant's fault, but they do an audit and they say, well, we've got a standard that says that these cables should have had yellow ties on them. You don't, you fail, pay the fine. It sometimes gets quite ludicrous. But the, a lot of the theater, there is actually, if you look at, I think Bruce Schneier, Counterpain Security and so forth, he does a lot of writing about that. A good example he uses is Lojack bracelets for babies in hospitals. The actual incidents, so basically a bracelet you put around the baby's ankle, that when the baby leaves the hospital, all the alarms go off and the SWAT teams arrive and the helicopters come. The idea being that it makes the mothers feel happy. It increases their believed security, even though there is actually not much of a risk that babies actually get stolen. I mean, that does happen. Sorry, here? Just to counterpoint that one, because I thoroughly believe that, but then last week there was an exact case of Wellington of exactly... But out of how many live births? <laughs> exactly. It's, it's a very... People are scared of the things that are unknown. I mean, you can have an entire talk on that. You're far more likely to be killed by a car or lightning than a terrorist attack. Yet, how many billions have we spent on anti-terrorism and we can't manage to... Let it. Anyway, fun little topic. I could spend ages on it, but I do have 20 minutes. So, this is hopefully the sneak slide. I, got, I, got, I managed to keep a very specific number in there. We have 238 separate pieces of kit, so I'm not counting, that's just inside our gateway. So the department's network comes up, then there's our 238 pieces of kit, and the other side of that is a whole stack of different networks, including the internet. We have that grab bag of services, it's pretty much everything. And I'm happy to answer vague questions about it. It does get to a point where it's big enough that certainly no one person or two person can do it. We have a team of 13 at the moment and it is definitely growing. It is a lot of work. It is one of those things that things that were two years ago are good to have, nice to have, good idea. We've now got things bettered down. We've got things to the point where we can increase our laziness. So things that we completely automated as much as is possible or reasonable, things that we documented very well, they're now put to bed and they've got a certain residual cost to keep them up to date, but we now have more effort for more things. So one of the things that laziness helps you do is retain staff, because one of the easiest ways we've found to keep staff is give them something interesting to do. So if your job is get that thing done, put to bed, and you can do something new, there's a lot of incentive to finish the job. There's a lot of incentive to keep things moving. It does also make for a great amount of cross-skilling. There's a huge amount of gear from different vendors in our environment. No one person can possibly be across them all. Even if you're theoretically you know, across all of that, you're not going to be an expert. You're not going to be able to answer the specific question that we need. So that's why, if this is any surprise, please leave. Documentation. Documentation is one of our key, almost essential pieces of laziness. I've spoken in the past about the wiki, so I'll do it fairly briefly. The wiki, it doesn't particularly matter which one you have. It doesn't even particularly matter if you decide that wikis aren't good and you've got a huge collection of whiteboards in some massive warehouse. If it works for you, go with it. We have a single docu wiki instance and we have a lot of little bespoke tools that we add, but for the most part, the biggest thing it has going for it is that it's one place. We don't have fragmentation of documentation. We do have lots of documentation that's not very good, but it gets better. And almost, it, it pretty much for us has the ISO 9000 series idea. It's a big set of formal documents that argue that if what you do matches your paperwork and you keep those two together, then improvements can be made on either side. So if you don't have any documentation about what you do, then it becomes very difficult to figure out what you're doing wrong or what you're not doing. When you have the documentation, then you end up with people being able to look at our documentation, external auditors, our customer, and have them say, you don't mention this. We've increasingly found that they ask more and more specific questions, more and more pointed questions, but one of the things that it gets us away from is repetition. Again, laziness. We've written all this documentation and we make it available to quite a few people. It's all, it's all authenticated, it's all logged, but our customer has access to our documentation. 
So we have documentation which says, here's exactly how we restore this type of device. Our customer can access that and ask us questions on it. And they do. One of the things about documentation, you've probably heard the same thing about commenting and source code. There's no point putting a comment which says, this takes the value in variable B, adds the number five, and then stores it in variable A. That's pretty much useless commenting if the next line is A equals B plus five. However, you see a lot of commenting like that because people know documentation is good, people know that you need to put comments on source code, but they don't know what to write. So they simply write what's obvious and what's in front of them. We've got a lot of that documentation because some of those previous security standards I mentioned requires that you have it. Uh, I kid you not, we got failed on an audit at one point, or not failed, but audit finding. You don't actually have a policy that says you change passwords when a sysadmin leaves. So we dutifully went out and wrote a document which said when sysadmins leave, we wrote. And it turned out then that we didn't actually have a particularly good articulation of when we change our passwords. We did have lots of policies all over the place, but that single finding, we went and did a bit more formal and wrote why we want to change passwords. And that gave us, because we started looking into the why, it gave us a lot more emphasis on where you actually have the risk, where you actually need to change your passwords. So simple cases without going into too many specifics, those passwords that are usable outside the environment need to be changed more frequently than those passwords that are only ever used inside the environment. So for example, the password for the switch immediately connected to an ancillary firewall far off to the left doesn't need to be changed as frequently as a password for a management console that, half, that all the staff access. And when you start looking at why, you end up being able to make much better decisions about how it is you're going to achieve your security targets. We have grown, I think since I reported last, I didn't include the stats because the security people asked me to remove them, but it's almost doubled since I gave my first talk on the wiki here. So in like two or three years, the size of our wiki in terms of gigabytes has doubled. And considering that that's mostly plain text, it's quite a, quite a good feat for us and it makes us very happy. But it also makes us lazy because I'm here and I'm hoping not to receive any calls this entire week, mainly because you leave a lot of documentation. Laziness is includes going on holidays. So, there's only a few more specific things. Do I have a, am I rushing? Yeah, cool. We have exceptions. So we have a wonderful policy which says no bad guys get in, and there are lots of exceptions. So one of the things that you have as policies is exceptions that you forget about. So someone three years ago had a particular project, it came across the top, and some person fairly highly in the organization says, this must happen. So you do it quickly, and you forget about it. So one of the things we have over time got a lot better at is document them all. And by this, we specifically mean why, who, and the killer one we've actually started getting a lot more aggressive at is for when we get rid of it. So we have exceptions, for example, for AV products. You know, on the internal network, we have semantic antivirus, perhaps, or we have the Microsoft antivirus, or we have Avast, or we have whatever. There's a gazillion of them. We have, uh, keep adding them because most sysadmins, when security is not their prime focus, they're happy, especially when it's someone else's problem, they're very happy to ask for the exception and not go back and say we don't need it anymore. And often they don't know they don't need it anymore. So one of the things we've done is we put in the reason why we put that exception in, which pretty much guarantees us that when we go back, rather than asking a very narrow, specific question, because that's what's actually in the device that has the policy, we say, are you still using Avast? And they go, what? What's that product? And we go, sure, not a problem. And we go and formally remove it all. We then have, and this is the really laziness part on steroids, we have quite a few complicated scripts that check that. It's amazing how often some things get done, even with formal change control, they get done, they probably shouldn't have been done. And not in a bad way, but in a laziness way, it gets too big. If you have 
a policy that's 100 items. That's sort of getting bigger than you can reasonably put, get your head around, especially if it's quite sophisticated. We want small policies, hence KISS and not the rock band. Most of our work is, in fact, around the process and how we manage things. Where I work, it's about, in some sense, one of the jargons is managed services, secure gateways and so forth. If you had a vendor come to you and say, we do it in a way that is completely different from anyone else, you wouldn't be interested because largely the end result defines in many ways how you do it and a lot of those security rules define how you're meant to do it. So if you had to put together a system and you only had four different devices you could use, there aren't too many permutations. So keeping it simple is definitely something that we recommend for laziness. We've had situations where a simple enough idea gets blown out of all complexity because a business requirement comes along that conflicts with another business requirement, and they're both valid. They both got business owners behind them who aren't just smoking the mushrooms, if anyone's from the ACT. <laughs> Does anyone know that bad reference? Uh, death Cat Mushrooms. There was a restaurant that cooked Death Cat Mushrooms in ACT recently, at the request of the people who ate them, but it was pretty nasty. Anyway, we have a situation where they're completely legitimate. And trying to keep it simple fails when the business is not complex. When, sorry, strike that, when the business is complex. But you don't need to go any further than it already is. Life ends up being more complex than you imagined. You don't need to make it more so. To be very specific, our rule sets for our firewalls, there's only two more slides. This is the second last. The rule sets on our firewalls are very large, mainly because of all the exceptions we have. But those firewall rules are pretty much there for a reason. Like we have one at the very end which says block everything and log. And that's there because it's a security policy which says you must have that rule. Everything else above that is up to the business. So we have a situation where the business says I need this to happen. And we go that's a very bad idea. And they go we don't care. So we end up having to write exactly that in our documentation. It is exactly what you need when you come along later and go, who the hell put this in? This is insane, why is it there? You follow the documentation and you find out that so-and-so said it should be there and you find a note, we love laziness, we find a note which says, authorised on such and such a date, he said he'd need it for 12 months. And you look at that date and you realise that that's four years ago. And then you see that he's re they've renewed it every year. Each time that happens, it is effectively us being lazy because the more rules you have, the harder it is to do that. And if you don't keep it under control at the very beginning, much like an inbox, you completely lose all hope of getting it under control. If you've got to the point where there are 100,000 emails in your inbox, just give up, delete it all. You're never going to get it under control. If you have a small subset, Andrew, you've got that many emails in your inbox? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Okay, we certainly have that problem that our firewall rules would grow infinitely if things didn't happen. They keep changing, like developers keep changing things for some reason, what they did a decade ago isn't good enough. So there's this new product and it needs a whole new set of security infrastructure put in place and then there's a new one and there's a new one. It just accumulates cruft. You can't look at cruft until you know why it's there, hence the emphasis on documentation for knowing why. And my final thing, because I'm happiest, because it's almost the laziest thing we do, web filtering, it is perhaps the most visible thing that my team does for the many thousand people who hate us or think that we are obstructing their ability to do work. But the two things we've done that we really do like from the point of view of laziness, one is there's a product called Web Pulse, comes from Blue Code. There's quite a few others. There's even a few decent free software alternatives, sort of. Each URL gets a category. So this URL is business. This URL is swimsuits. This URL is nudity. We then have an AD group for every one of those categories. So there is inside the organization, there is an AD group for pornography. And you just get put into it. And we don't care. 
And the agency I'm working with, there's quite a few people in that group, all perfectly legitimately. It's amazing how many people t say they're involved in that. <laughs> legitimately, it's, it's apparently all official. I just don't ask any questions. But the beautiful part about it from our point of view is we don't care. Our policy is granular enough that we can say, here is all the knobs you can twist, but we don't really care how they twist them. <laughs> the second thing, this is probably the only time I get to interact with end users, is web filtering. It is amazing how much effort you save by spending that extra day getting error messages run past end users. Like literally the focus group idea, we showed them three different error messages and said, which one makes the most sense to you, what would you do? We spent a fair bit of effort on our error messages to the end users, and it pays off in spades. By the time we ended up improving it, we could literally have the service desk, which is not my team, but the people who people phone up, they showed something like a 90% reduction month on month in the number of calls, just because we'd made it simpler. We'd literally, at one point, there was a thing which said, you must do this and it gave, an, it gave a link, and then the two steps down was, oh, by the way, do this, and we simply reordered it, and that was about the most important thing we did, because people don't read error messages. As a rule, we're all guilty of this, but we actually spent a lot of effort cleaning up our error messages, making them simpler, like we literally removed all the technical detail, and it ended up saving us a huge amount of money, and hence making profit, with our users because the error messages were a hell of a lot more understandable. It basically, the new error message amounts to, this is how you get approval. And that's pretty much the error message. You've been denied this reason, and there's like one line up the very top, it's in the title of the web page, and then the entire body of the web page is how you get approval to do this. It, it's very, very much streamlined. And that's internal, so we don't get it. We literally get the, by the time it gets to us and it's costing us money, we get the thing which says, I approve so-and-so doing this. And that's, that's pretty much it. So it saves us a hell of a lot of effort. It put a lot of effort in, like we spent a lot of effort getting it done, and it saved us a hell of a lot more than we ever expected that it could. And the final one, because it is so topical for us, we're here, like for me, this is training. It's very, very good to have an employer that sends you here and pays for you to be here, like this is work time for me, I get to put a timesheet in. So that is awesome. If you have an employer like that, stay there. There aren't a hell of a lot of them. There are many that will say, oh, this is leave. But having an employer that lets you come to conferences as work, it is worth more than the amount of money you spend on the employee. We have an awesome manager. He is ex-military. So the two things soldiers do is get drunk and train. Apparently they're trying to get down on the get drunk bit. He definitely comes from the era where they, what they called the koalas, don't shoot, don't export. In other words, he didn't ever leave Australia as a soldier. But he definitely has the training thing down pat. It doesn't help to say that you will do training. And a lot of the times, some of the training we do, the big thing that employers shy away from from training is they hear the word training and they think dollars. It doesn't have to be dollars. We have a system whereby each, uh, it's not quite as regular as we'd like it to be because work keeps intruding, but we do have regular sessions where someone prepares a presentation on a particular topic for the rest of the team. And that doesn't particularly cost the organization a lot of money, but it has a huge amount of benefit, often because the process of preparing a presentation forces you to get the structure, at least vaguely, into a thing that makes sense. And when you show it to someone else, if you can't explain something, I mean, the grandfather test, if you can't explain it to your grandparents, then you don't really understand it, is a fairly common idea you see in some of the hard sciences. It really has its place in IT. If something's so complex that you can't manage a five-minute presentation, then you haven't got it down right. And for us, security is part of our game, KISS, if it's so complex you can't explain it to your own team members, then you really have to go back to the drawing board and think, what are we doing? We can't explain it. But the formal training, to continue, the formal training definitely has its place. We have one awesome piece in that, one of those documentations at the top, the security frameworks. There is a standard that says we require formal training, and we milk it for everything we can get. <laughs> 
But if you don't have something like that, it definitely has its payback. And one of the things we've done a few times, and we're not made of money, we are here for profit where I am, the person who goes on the training course, you make it effectively obligatory that they give at least something back to the people who didn't go. Even, uh, you make sure, at the minimum, that they bring back the course notes and so forth. That's just a given. But you also require them, not straight away, like a little while later, to give a, give a you know, here's a rundown of what the course was. We review training courses. It's amazing how often you find that a particular training course with a particular instructor was awesome, but the same training course and another instructor wasn't as good. We keep a lot of that feedback. We document a lot of that feedback. So if anyone's interested in trainers in Canberra, there are some very good ones, there are some very bad ones. Anyway, I'm happy to look into the light and see if I can see someone. Probably not enough time. Not a huge amount of time. Is there any questions that are particularly burning? How do you push back on auditors and other people that have inane requirements that have no basis in policy? So how do we push back on inane requests from auditors? Unfortunately, where we are, um, we obey, mostly because they, we're fairly lucky the auditors have policy they point to. Um, the answer in part is the pushback isn't to us, like where we are, it is a business decision. Like security is to support business. There's no such thing as security in isolation. We have the most secure thing that is useless. The business is the one that accepts the risk. Like ultimately, if a policy says don't do that, and the business says we have to, then as long as the business isn't doing that unawares, that's the answer. And in fact, where we are, even in government, there are rules that say, thou shalt not do this, unless risk is accepted. Like, literally, the, the actual way the policies that we would deal with are worded are, this is the level of authority that is necessary to accept this risk. So there's a rule which says, you know, you must use this standard of encryption. And that's pretty much a must, but against that, Here's how you get a, an exception approved. Like, if you have a policy that doesn't allow exceptions, that is fundamentally broken. There's always an exception. A couple of things relate to configuration management here, which you haven't mentioned. Um, the firewall rules, surely they should come from the configuration management system as a result of uh, linking uh, uh, clients with servers. And similarly, um, uh, except the exceptions should be uh, removed by the uh, configuration management system. Uh, do you use a configuration management system? And if not, why not? The answer is, where we are, we're not allowed, is basically the answer. Um, that's not lazy. Oh, no, no, that's, that's not lazy. This is, it's laziness on our part that we haven't managed yet to make the government change those rules. The government, to, to answer the question a bit better, the government has a process by which, and this isn't just our government, the, the US and the Yanks and the Canadians and a few others, there's a system whereby a product gets a stamp to say it works. And this process has almost no connection to reality in that a process that approves something doesn't mean that it's good, it just means it's approved. We have a path of least resistance it is possible, there are quite a few very elegant tools out there that will allow you to say, this server needs to talk to this server and then it will configure all your firewalls for you. Yeah. And it will do the Cisco's, it will do quite a few of the vendors. Those products are specifically excluded in our environment. And if, if your environment doesn't exclude them, I'd thoroughly recommend them. Yeah. But even, even in that scenario, there will be, like those rules themselves are in some sense exceptions. Like it, the point I was trying to get to is your exceptions are part of the policy. Like in some sense, the policy is simply all the exceptions. So you might have a policy which says no connections. Like by default, you've decided to whitelist or blacklist. At a certain level, your firewall lets everything through and blocks the bad stuff, or blocks everything um, that it doesn't allow. So black or white by default. Most organizations, certainly the ones I deal with, tend towards the block all by default. But it's perfectly valid to say we allow all by default and we only block, you know, different organizations have different answers. Those products, we would love to use them. We've evaluated a few, like we've used them internally, tried to figure out whether they work for us. It ends up being too much paperwork, that the laziness factor just goes too high. We could get our client to accept them, but then you become an exception in your own right and suddenly tall poppy syndrome. If you, 
in the managed security area, if you're doing something vastly different, you've got to have your paperwork just so perfect. It's got to be so perfectly justified that something that would work, if you're doing the same as everyone else, there's a quite a bit of latitude, there's quite a bit of grandfathering saying you were working okay before, so we'll allow a little bit of abnormality. As soon as you try to break new ground, it's, government almost hates itself and won't allow new stuff without someone else having done it first, but the first person's the first guy who gets killed. So we're in there for profit and therefore we don't allow, we're not allowed to do it. I've tried, I've literally tried a few of those products. We do use the ones that pull back. So there are products that do all the writing for you, so they will literally push to all of your firewalls. We have a, quite a few scripts that we've written to pull and analyze, but that's about as far as we can get. And certainly dollars worth, if you're not allowed to use the product to push, it gets very cost prohibitive. You're basically buying a fancy toy to do half the job. So I'll, I'll talk to you after. I'm, I haven't answered the question particularly well. Um, we, uh, we get a lot of um, we get a lot of messages from places like CSOC and stuff like that saying, um, oh, there's some network threat and uh, its command and control server might be at this IP address. Um, you know, don't look at it, but you might need to block it. Yep. Um, and then you won't hear anything more about it ever. Yes. And so your firewall list could grow once a day by one rule ad infinitum. Mm -hmm. And maybe like someone's running something stupid like XP, SP2, and it's still vulnerable to that like five years later. Yep. Um, like, are you able to cull any of your rules? So in our particular case, we, we have a, a single firewall rule that we add those alerts to and the internet, you know, the SANS Internet Storm Center and a few other places where they give you alerts. In our case, we prune those. We, we contacted them and you know, the DSDN asked, this is absurd, we can't just keep adding rules. And they effectively said, look, six months for us. But that's, we've, we formally ran that by our business, by the client, and they said yes. So it, there's no logic to some of those alerts. Some of those alerts, I've seen those alerts come out three weeks after the public mails came out. Sometimes they come out like you don't hear anything in the public about them. And it's, from our point, it's really operational response. The client says we do it, we do it, we prune it later. Often um, the ones that get hits stay. So one of our reasons for reviewing is the ones that we've had hits on. So the, uh, the, the topic, uh, CSOC, there's an organisation that gives out alerts for government agencies that says this bad stuff may have happened, check your firewalls to see if this IP address has appeared or check your email logs to see if this email address has appeared. Those come out often for reasons that aren't given, like they literally don't tell you and they say they don't tell you and they say don't ask, which is a lot of fun. The ones that we have hits on, we definitely keep. And we keep them until they don't have hits for a period of several months. I think six months is our current rule. Mainly because as you say, the size. There's a limit to how many rules you can have. Cool, oh, I'm happy to talk. I'm here for that reason, I think. Have fun. <laughs>